Hello everyone, I'm going to rank every video game I finished for the first time this year. There are zero modern games on this list, so if that's what you're looking for, then feel free to look elsewhere. All of this is my personal opinion, obviously, but my opinion is also objectively correct, so feel free to be wrong down in the comments. There are chapters down below if you're looking for something specific. And with that out of the way, let's get started. Nineteen Forty Two Joint Strike on Xbox 360 is a reimagining of the original 1984 arcade shoot 'em up classic from Capcom that gives it a new coat of 3D paint, more frequent and varied boss fights, a modern scoring system, and a much needed update to the soundtrack so it no longer sounds like a middle schooler doing a drum riff on your cochlea. As is typical of reimaginings, not much actually remains from the original game at all, and it should more or less be taken as its own separate experience. And that own experience is pretty weak. This game has a few genre no-nos that combine to make it a tepid shmup at best. The game is extremely short, even for the genre, clocking it at only 25 minutes. That could almost be forgiven if it had the gameplay depth and difficulty to support that length, but it's precisely the opposite. The enemies have incredibly basic patterns that won't challenge even genre newbies, which combined with the generous health bar and plentiful life pickups make this game a complete walk in the park. I was even able to blind one credit clear the game, and I'm by no means a shmup veteran. Even if the mandate from Capcom was to make an entry-level game for the more casual western audience, they went far overboard here, creating a shmup that barely holds the attention of the player, even on their first run. It does at least have an option for co-op, but that would only serve to make this game even easier than it already is. The game also added in the charge fire mechanic from 1941, but I couldn't find any reason to use it, due to the enemy patterns failing to make it advantageous, and because its damage output compared with the regular shot was negligible at best, if not outright non-existent. The questionable control scheme also means that you'll have to spam the fire button throughout the entire game, like you're running from one end of Liberty City to the other. At every level aside from the graphics and soundtrack, this would be a milk and water effort for any shmup, but this being a 19 XX game is just an insult. I'm placing 1942 Joint Strike in the upper D tier. Ant 2 on original Xbox was a childhood mainstay of mine, and I really loved it a lot, but never got very far in it, mostly because my smooth brain couldn't understand how to do the challenges. I was looking for something nostalgic and chill to play, so I thought I'd pop it in, beat it in a couple hours, and have a good time. Worst choice possible. I had no idea what I was in for. It's still a good game, mind you. The tight balance of sim and arcade snowboarding make for a game that's easy to pick up, but takes a while to get good at. The graphics are easily some of the best on the original Xbox, this being one of the few games that supports full 720p on the system. And the soundtrack is just impeccable. Over 15 hours of licensed indie hits from electronica to metal to surfer rock. It's a very well-made game. As the hours go on though, you quickly start to notice that it's getting tough pretty quickly. Granted, I'm quite far from an extreme sports specialist, but that sentiment has been shared by a lot of folks, even some bona fide boarding gods. Tough is underselling it. This game often expects utter perfection out of you, especially in the pro and photoshoot challenges. It wasn't uncommon to find myself bashing my head against a challenge for 20 or 30 tries, even in the mid-game. Granted this is my first time trying to finish it, but this is a game I'm already intimately familiar with and know the mechanics by heart. It got to the point where by the two-third mark the game just seems inconsistent and unfair a lot of the time. Despite that I stuck it out and I didn't just finish the game, I 100%ed it, which is abnormal for me. By that point, after doing all the extremely difficult legend challenges, some of which people are still stuck on to this day, and all the stage 3 photo shoots, I was just relieved that it was over. That happy-go-lucky playthrough I had wanted turned into a total stress fest. I know this all sounds fairly negative, however, there is a but coming. I'd still recommend it. Yes, this game takes a long time to get good at and even longer to beat, but if you go into it expecting a challenge and maybe some frustrations along the way as you learn the mechanics, I think you'll still fall in love with this game, just like so many others have. Once I started leaning into the difficulty and deriving satisfaction from not just beating a single challenge, but getting better at the game in general, my whole playthrough turned around. Sometimes I'd stop playing in a huff, and then just a few hours later I'd want to get back on and try again. Maybe this is nostalgia talking, but Amps 2 just has an ineffable quality that makes it special, and that's something that few games can pull off. This is a title that's so hard to put a number on because it's so hit or miss. All I can say is, give it a try. If you bounce off of it, that's fine. It's not for everyone. Personally, I went from loving this game to hating it, and then coming all the way back around to appreciating it even more than I ever did. And that's just the kind of emotional roller coaster that we all need sometimes to shake things up. I'll give it a B. I 
I hate to be that guy who shits on a game that doesn't really deserve it, especially a licensed game, but if you make a game like this and try to sell it for 20 bucks, you kind of deserve it. During Barbie Horse Adventure's Blue Ribbon Race for Game Boy Advance, you'll mostly be exploring tracks full of barely masked reused assets in a quest for equestrian dominance. I've played Barbie games before that were better than I thought they would be. This is not one of them. You control the game from an isometric view, but the controls are also tilted 45 degrees, meaning that up is northeast, left is northwest, etc. That isn't too hard to come to terms with, but the gameplay gets stale remarkably quickly. Most of the levels aren't fast-paced races, but more of an exploratory affair to try and nab every collectible and still finish the race in time. The horse itself is painfully slow and unwieldy, which removes whatever potential excitement the gameplay could have had. The worst part is probably the music, though. The game has two tracks in it, the main menu music and the music for the entire game. Both are, being generous here, 30 second loops of the same ambient tones. They were honestly a good listen for the first, you know, two minutes, but unfortunately this game is two hours. Have you ever tried listening to the same song and repeat for two hours? Your mind turns into Matrix porridge. You do at least unlock some horse factoids as you play, and you can customize Barbie and your trusty steed to a minor degree, but that's about all there is to say about this game. I'm often impressed by the love and creativity poured into licensed titles, especially because it's a type of game that's been treated quite unfairly in the media. Blue Ribbon Race stays true to the stereotype, though. A short, boring, graphically basic romp that's hard to control and lacks any semblance of passion or vision shat out onto a cart to make money off of unsuspecting little girls and their all-too-obliging guardians. Despite the last two years being flops, I do love Barbie games and the IP itself, so once a year I'll still keep up my search for a truly great one. Blue Ribbon Race, though, I think is going in the lower D tier. I can't put it in F just because I still had fun while I was playing it, which is more than I can say for a lot of games, but this Barbie adventure is not worth anyone's time, never mind money. I played a fair bit of Brute Force on Xbox as a kid, but never got very far into it. In this game, you're part of a squad of four commandos known as Brute Force, a lizard dinosaur named Brutus who can see through walls and heal with his spirit of vengeance, a synthetic sniper, Flint, who has an actual aimbot, the bullheaded Tex who can akimbo any weapon, and the tech and infiltration specialist, Hawk, who can go invisible and assassinate foes with her deadly power blade. Plus, she has the special ability to make my pants smaller. Together, you attempt to save the Confederation from a zealous alien cult bent on galactic domination. You'll travel to a small variety of locales, but most of them get reused later on in the campaign, which lends itself to an overall sense of banality, added to by most of the maps lacking any distinctive character in their design. The majority of areas you'll fight through are flat and uninspired. The music is also nothing to write home about, in spite of it being partly composed by Jesper Kidd and James Hannigan. It's mostly just your typical generic military shooter fare. Not awful by any means, but it rarely stands out. The gunplay is also... fine. There's a lot of weapons to choose from, but this game falls into the trap of most third-person shooters by having weapons with good sound design, but none of them feel punchy or unique. I stress that's more of a problem with the genre than this game in particular, which is in part what made Gears of War's completely over-the-top weaponry stand out so much among the crowd. Still though, I'd be remiss not to mention it. Very few third-person shooters have had satisfying weaponry, and it's the same deal with Brute Force. You may have noticed a trend here. A lot of this game is just fine. It functions and plays well, looks and sounds good, but it doesn't do anything to set itself apart. Like, at all. There are more pressing issues, though. The AI for your squad mates is really terrible. It's fine when they're following you in a tight squad, but if you leave one of them on their own, they will stand out in the middle of the battlefield with no cover, get shot 200 times in a row using all your med packs in the process, and then die. Oh yeah, your squad mates use your med packs, without your permission. But they'll always leave the last med kit for you. I can't tell you how often I saw my teammates getting drilled without going for cover and using up all my precious heals. Basically, this game necessitates that you play it co-op. The AI is simply too stupid and you don't have an effective enough means of commanding them for you to play this game by yourself. Thankfully, Brute Force does have four-player co-op for the entire campaign, but wait a second before you call the boys over because the co-op has a fatal flaw. If one of your squad mates dies, they're dead for the entire mission until you go back to command and they can be cloned again. Well, that doesn't sound so bad, I hear you thinking. You might be dead for, what, 10 minutes at most while you finish the level? No, 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 I didn't say level. You're dead for the entire mission, some of which are three, four, five parters taking upwards of an hour. So unless your friends are willing to just sit there and watch you try to complete the mission for a while because they took a random rocket to the face, I'd avoid four-player co-op. I think where this game would shine the best is in two-player co-op, where each of you are responsible for two squad mates. That way, if one of you happens to die, you can take over another squad mate instead of sitting there like a doofus for the better part of an hour. That said, do I even recommend playing this game? No, probably not. 
there's a vast array of better co-op games out there. Hell, there's a plethora of better co-op third-person shooters out there, specifically. I'll give this one a high C, just because if you and another skilled friend play through it, I think you'll still have a good time, but throughout most of the game, both of you will probably be thinking in the back of your minds that you could be playing Gears, or Resi 5, or Sniper Elite, or Army of Two, or a dozen other games, and be having more fun. I already covered Bullet Soul and its updated version, Infinite Burst, in my downloadable games for 360 videos, but to sum it up, this has everything that I want in a shoot 'em up. Tight controls, stunning visuals, gameplay that has its own unique feel and is still challenging but not impossible, plus multiple playable characters and co-op. Will it be considered a classic by genre vets? No. This is definitely the popcorn of shmups. Delicious, but lacking any real substance to keep you going. However, if you can look past the mediocre scoring system and just enjoy what's in front of you for a few hours, Bullet Soul is one of the most fun shmups on the 360. I'll stick it in the lower A's. I will again stress that this is one of the most expensive games on the entire console if you want to grab a physical copy, so I'd go digital all the way on this one. Castle Crashers on PC is a beat-em-up where if the beautifully drawn visual and toilet humor can carry it for you for the 4-5 to five hours of playtime, then I guess it could be an enjoyable experience, but the guys at the Behemoth probably should have actually played a beat-em-up before trying to make one of their own. This game honestly does commit, like, literally every game design, be like, beat-em-up game design sin in the book. Like, this game writes the, the book I on just, bad beat-em-up design. The, oh, cool. <laughs> Enemies have attacks that you have practically no defense against. They either go right through your block, or they come out too quickly to dodge. My favorite example of this was the bats that stunlock you for 30 seconds straight while the boss literally takes a shit on you and you die. Enemies also constantly spam ranged attacks, which come out instantaneously and fly extremely quickly, once again making them nearly impossible to defend against. On top of that, their AI is designed such that they'll spam their ranged attacks at the exact interval where you get hit unavoidably on the precise frame you get up, often in repetition. Rather than being aggressive, the enemy AI is programmed to constantly run away from you, making just getting a hit on one of them an annoying game of cat and mouse that only serves as a test of patience and not skill. The enemies also have iframes at unfair moments, like after you knock them down, when they can do a roll to get up and close the gap with you in which they're completely invincible. The vertical hitboxes are some of the most unforgiving I've ever seen, which obviously leads to horrific game feel as you whiff attacks that you would hit in any other game and get hit by enemies that are nowhere near you. This is made even worse by enemies and especially some bosses' propensity to move in fast diagonal patterns that render them unhittable, usually while flying as well. The bosses themselves, along with every other enemy in the game, are corporeal, which means that instead of phasing through a boss so that you can get below it like you would in any other beat-em-up, you get stuck behind them and can't even find your player characters since they don't have an outline. This is especially a problem in a game like Castle Crashers, where the bosses are massive and take up half the screen. Most bosses, especially the final one, are just stat checks to make sure you've grinded enough to beat them, and the remainder are brainless puzzle bosses that are either painfully easy or have such broken hitboxes that it's a Christmas miracle when you can actually put hits on them. All this might seem normal to people that aren't familiar with beat-em-ups and think that the entire genre is just mashing buttons until you win. Good beat-em-ups force you to be careful with how you move, when you attack, how you prioritize targets, and how you control the arena, but this game is as mindless as it gets. There's also no meaningful progression. The level-ups are practically inconsequential, each level only giving you a single point to each stat. Especially once you get farther into the game, defense is practically a worthless stat when you're getting bodied by attacks that do over 100 damage. Meanwhile, your defense might subtract 10 off of that, but it's also a necessary stat since you'll get hit unavoidably so often in this game. Agility is also pointless since there's no reason to choose arrows over magic, aside from the fact that they made one boss arbitrarily take damage from nothing aside from archery, and the game is such chaotic nonsense that the movement speed is worthless. The pets do so little statistically or with their powers that their presence is completely irrelevant, and since weapons are only acquired through RNG, you'll likely never get something you actually want unless you grind for it. But again, each weapon affects so little that there's hardly even a point. I don't know man, the full playthrough is up on the channel if you think I'm being overly dramatic or too critical, but comparing this game to other genre classics is a joke. Castle Crashers is a frustrating, skillless, and dull game that only managed to become popular off of being backpacked by its stellar visuals and by being in a genre that at the time had been dead for more than a decade. When it released, clearly no one, including the enormous influx of wet-behind-the-ears reviewers in the mid-2000s, remembered what a good beat-em-up actually felt like. C-tier. I fully admit going in that I lack the eloquence to succinctly elucidate what it's like to play this game. 
but I feel it's my duty to try. Crash Bandicoot on PlayStation by the schadenfreude fetishists at Naughty Dog once again definitively proves that any decent game this company has ever made was completely by accident. This is what happens when a team with zero talent tries to copy Donkey Kong Country's homework with absolutely no understanding of what made those games challenging but fun, what should have been improved about them, and how drastically the formula would need to be changed so that it could work with an added third dimension. The level design is... Well, we don't even have a strong enough word in English, so I guess I have to go with sadistic. Every level is filled to the brim with first-time player traps that will send you back entire stages worth of progress since the save points are so absurdly spread out. I'll say it loudly for the people in the back. Repeating large sections of a video game is not difficulty, it's padding. The hitboxes on platforms and enemies will leave you scratching your head almost every time you die. Later on, the devs will start combining these elements with timing-based enemies and obstacles such that the entire game becomes an RNG shitfest. All this while fighting the non-functional physics that will always find a way to screw you over. Due to not having a persistent shadow, every single jump is a completely blind leap of faith, and if you ever over or undershoot, you're just dead, because the momentum makes it nearly impossible to make small corrections to land on the two pixels of platform the game decided was corporeal. There is absolutely zero skill or challenge in this game, just you mashing your head against a roulette wheel until it finally hits black. That is if you somehow keep from self-deleting long enough to make headway. You'd think that a consummate level of ineptitude would be required to create a game this bad, but to me there actually seems to be lucid intent behind the overwhelming majority of these atrocities, which just makes it so much worse. The fact that this game was ever popular in any capacity is the surest sign that humanity needs to end. At no point should any human being derive a sense of pleasure or accomplishment while playing this game. I am convinced at this point that Crash only sold well because humans hate themselves and everyone around them so badly that they wanted to troll their friends and family by recommending one of the most profoundly disgusting, degenerate, depraved, degrading six hours of torture that the breadth of human imagination could possibly conceive. And that level of malice simply cannot be overcome. At this point we just need to nuke the planet and hope that next time evolution can do better. It's time to take one for the team, guys. Actually, you know how there have been several experiments proving that human beings would rather shock themselves than be alone with their thoughts for even short periods of time? That's how this game got popular, because the human condition is so inconceivably repugnant in its absurd meaninglessness that we would rather self-harm than simply sit quietly for a while. If you like this game, I don't want you anywhere near me. Do not ever speak to me, you crazed psychopathic lunatic. You caustic avatar of dread and carnage. Please seek help for all the good it'll do you. If you like this game, then you've clearly never played another platformer. Hell, probably not even another video game in your entire life. So I'll try to give you some recommendations of games that are vastly superior to this one. Here we go. Bubsy 3D, Sonic 2006, Super Mario Bros. The Lost Levels, Shrek, Bow and Wonder World, Ninja Breadman, Superman 64, and of course, the GOAT, Glover. I just, I don't know what else to say. I can't describe how disappointed, shocked, and nauseated I am at this game's existence. I mean that literally, too. I've had experiences with video games that have pushed me to the brink of insanity, where lines were crossed that never should be, but I've never played a game that took the entire next day to recover from my mental and physical wounds. Saltro was right. Mental anguish is so much worse than physical. God, I mean, what else can even be said? It's a crime against humanity, it's a disgrace to the species, the fact that I have to share a planet with it and its creators gave me existential depression the likes of which I haven't had in almost a decade. Were I a nobler man, I'd spend my every waking moment attempting to erase this game from existence down to its last pirated ISO. This video game, this thing, is a monument to all of humanity's sins, a warning to any intelligent life who finds it to not be like us, to be better than our basis instincts, to overcome our antipathy, to move past our antagonism, our suspicion our differences and move forward into a brave new world of peace, understanding, and enlightenment. Crash Bandicoot broke my kneecaps, gave me an anxiety disorder, killed my brother, banged my wife, made my parents get a divorce, and did 9-11. F tier. Eat Lead, The Return of Matt Hazard on 360 is weird. You are Matt Hazard, a video game action hero that saw a serendipitous rise to fame in the 8 and 16-bit eras, as your version of side-scrolling action had the right pizzazz to make 80s kids feel like badasses. After that, you started to come on hard times. 3D flop after 3D flop with some weird spin-offs in there along the way. Now you're a washed-up has-been with more empty beer bottles than fan mail sitting on the end table. This isn't you, you think. It's time to get back in the game. Regrettably, a really cool premise that I honestly cannot believe wasn't a direct response to Duke Nukem Forever as this actually came up beforehand, still feels about as generic. 
Eat Lead often finds itself engaging in the same tired tropes that I thought this game was supposed to be making fun of. From bog standard third person shooter gameplay with questionable game feel to NPCs that have no meaningful characterization outside of their assigned roles in the parody, and boss fights that are a fun reference to different games and genres but don't go far enough to be anything more than that. The level design is as unexceptional as it gets, Matt controls like a dump truck with a bum tire, the weapons all feel and sound like wet farts, there's no aim assist, the checkpoints are sparse, you take a hell of a lot of damage from very bullet spongy flank happy enemies, and to top it off, the cutscenes are unskippable. The length is also padded out by enemies that start soaking up even more bullets in the latter third in a difficulty curve that gave me trouble in a few spots, even as a genre veteran on the default setting. A game that was supposed to be making fun of samey third-person shooters turned into a samey third-person shooter. I can't really say that this game is terribly funny either. It has its moments, but it more leans on the side of sardonicism or camp than outright hilarity. And even so, the script would fall flat if it wasn't being delivered by top-tier Hollywood talent. Hell, most of it does anyway. Maybe I'm being too hard on it here, but I don't think so. Even with middling expectations, this game failed to meet them. I hate to say it, but I think critics were actually right about this one. It's one of the best examples of a wasted premise I've seen in a while. D tier. I plan on doing a full review of Enslaved Odyssey to the West that should be out in a few weeks time, so for now I'm just gonna stick it in the B tier. Everyday Shooter is a digital-only indie game on the PC, PSP, and PlayStation 3, which is where I played it. It's a twin-stick shooter made entirely by a single developer, Jessica Mack. Going in, I thought this was going to be one of my favorite games of the year. The abstract visuals combined with the acoustic rock soundtrack make this game look and sound like it was made for me personally. Like, I can't overstate it, this is my aesthetic to a T. It also takes a cue from Rez in that when you destroy enemies instead of regular explosion sound effects, it plays a guitar riff, which punctuates and magnifies the soundtrack. There's also a comboing system that differs from level to level, and you have to take a minute to figure out how each new enemy type and power-up works before you can use them to their full effect. Despite the game's fairly short length, it can get pretty tough. It took me quite a few runs with unlocking more lives and practicing particular stages before I could finally clear it. There's also a bunch of bonus extras that change up the look and feel of the game if you want to grind out the points for them. Speaking of points, that's one of the biggest issues I have with this game. The points you get from killing enemies are how you buy unlocks, but you also get a much-needed 1-up at increasing intervals of score. Actually, collecting them is the issue, though. They magnetize to your character, but not nearly strong enough. Your square is far faster than the points are, meaning that if you don't steer directly over them, you're probably just going to fly right past them. This leads to you having to do a sort of stutter step so that you can actually acquire points while still being on the move, but as should be obvious, this completely wrecks the flow of the movement and makes for poor game feel. The weak magnetism becomes an even larger problem, though, because it's compounded by the points also staying on the screen for a fairly small amount of time, especially considering the crazy combos you can pull off in some levels. Sometimes you can fill the entire screen with points, which is utterly deafening by the way, a fair warning, but you can only collect a few of them before they disappear, which leads to the comboing system, the main unique draw of the gameplay, being disincentivized. The comboing itself is also sometimes so difficult to pull off and relies on so much RNG for proper enemy and power-up placement that you're far better off point-wise just ignoring that system. That's not even mentioning what is, for me, a death sentence for this game, or any twin stick for that matter, especially one that requires a lot of precision when aiming. Your aim is locked to eight directions. I swear, if there's one thing I can't stand in any multi-directional shooter, it's that. Granted, this is an issue because it was originally developed for PC, but still. This game requires you to be constantly on the move and shoot accurately across large distances. Not having full analog aiming even on the PS3 and PSP versions is a big disappointment. Those are the extent of my criticisms, which I know sounds like a lot, but on the other hand, the controls are minty, the hitboxes are fair, the visuals are crisp, the vibes are bumping, and the difficulty is just about spot on. It really comes down to the individual whether or not this will be worth your time. Even with the immediate connection I had with this game, I think there's still too many things holding it back. I wish it had been workshopped just a little bit more, because a lot of the problems it has are relatively easy fixes. That in mind, I'll give Everyday Shooter a B. Frontline's Fuel of War on 360 was a game that, if you were anything like me, you probably looked at on the shelf of GameStop a hundred times and never decided to buy. Probably with good reason. Do the kids still know what GameStop was, or does everyone think they've always been the gaming version of Hot Topic? Frontline's is an open battlefield type military shooter in much the same vein as Battlefield 2 Modern Combat. You have your objective, but exactly how you accomplish it is mostly left up to you. 
The game is set in the near future, which can only mean one thing. XM8s. XM8s everywhere. In 2024, a lack of oil is causing worldwide riots and World War III has begun with the US fighting a prolonged war against a nationalistic Russia and a China who have reunited with Chinese Taipei for access to some of the last refineries in existence and the remaining scraps of land with untapped resources. You know, just your typical military shooter nonsense that would never happen in real life. Um, well, this game doesn't retain its predecessor's best feature, the on-the-fly character swapping, it does have a few advantages of its own. Mainly gunplay that doesn't feel like wading through a swamp. The game feel is actually remarkably sharp for a brand new dev, which would continue to be Chaos Studios' primary strength in Homefront. That said, their first game would also be their second to last, and it's not hard to see why. The campaign is fairly short, clocking only about six hours, and it doesn't have many moments that stand out. It's one of those campaigns that feels like it was mostly cobbled together at the last moment from the multiplayer maps, and then they tried to slap some sort of plot on top of it to bridge the levels together. Needless to say, the intriguing setup in the intro movie isn't followed through on whatsoever, and the game turns into the same tired formula you've played a hundred times from the word go. The guns also lack a lot of tactile feedback. They're not the worst I've seen, but everything from the sound design to the almost non-existent recoil needed a lot more love put into it. There's not a whole lot more to say about Frontlines. It's a so-so attempt at cloning an already milquetoast offering from EA that had no chance of standing out in a market oversaturated with excellent first-person shooters. I can't imagine there are that many fans of Battlefield 2 out there, but if for some reason you want more, it's a decent pickup. For everyone else, stay away. Frontlines is an upper C tier. Gauntlet Slayer Edition on PS4 is truly one of the games of all time. Despite falling somewhere in between a remake and reimagining of the 1985 classic, it's a remarkably stale title that only managed to keep my eyes open due to me playing it with a party of three friends while I was drunk on Christmas night. Basically optimal conditions. This game has almost nothing going for it. Throughout most of the four hour campaign I was falling asleep with little in the way of interesting enemies and counter design or progression to keep me engaged. Minor loadout changes brought in a bit of variety until you realize that the new powers were usually a lot worse than the default ones. The visuals are also generic, samey, and frankly belong on the 360, and the soundtrack is barely even existent. The only thing that managed to wake me up a bit was the absurd difficulty spike at the final boss, which took almost an hour of attempts in and of itself, but it felt more out of place than satisfying, especially because half of my crew weren't experienced gamers. Overall, this is easily the second worst thing you can buy that says Gauntlet on it. It spits in the face of fans who will have to wait even longer for a true series revival instead of a game that can't even capture the fun of the original Gauntlet with the advantage of 30 years of game design and technological advancement at its back, or be a halfway decent reimagining in its own right. It's a D. After Epic handed over development of the series to People Can Fly, Gears of War has never been the same. The meaty sound effects, visceral over-the-top combat, and a story that wasn't too quick to betray its depth, or could be completely ignored if you chose, made this series something special. The passion was evident in every headshot, chainsaw kill, and jib, every tiny detail put into the visuals and sound. Truly great games are often something that you can't put into words, because on every level they just feel so right, but you could dig into why Gears of War is great for hours. That's been missing for a while now. Most recently, they even gave up their pretenses and dropped the war from the title altogether. And this is the game that started the series down the dark path. Gears of War Judgment on 360's main campaign lacks the varied combat scenarios of its predecessors, instead railroading you into horde mode after horde mode to the point where it feels like you're just playing the multiplayer with extra steps. It's classic padding mission design. The companion AI is also dumb as hell, and the game feel is just a bit off somehow. The roadie run shakes so much that it makes you nauseated, and the aiming doesn't feel as good as the trilogy. The main draw of the story falls utterly flat, as the trial is set up as a sham from the very beginning, and it's as bland and predictable as the opening moments would make you think. Big Bad shows up. Command thinks Big Bad not so bad, but is. So man use missile to kill Big Bad. There's no intrigue or mystique. The game never makes you doubt Cole or Baird for a moment. It's just a story about leaders being stupid once again. The new members of the squad add little to the narrative. Sophia is used primarily as a convenient plot device, and Paddock hardly gets any development outside of the rare passive-aggressive comment. 
Aside from a few new guns which are decent additions to the sandbox, and two new enemy types that are so bullet spongy and obnoxious that they drain your ammo and patience in equal measure, the only gameplay add-on from Gears 3 is the declassified objectives, where you can take an optional handicap to gain stars quicker. Most of these are fairly basic, like a smoky haze covering the arena and obscuring your vision, or being forced to only use certain types of weapons. It sounds like an interesting changeup, but they mostly get repetitive and annoying. They aren't very well implemented either, it seems like they were just thrown in at the last moment to try and make the campaign even the slightest bit more fun and varied, but they don't succeed. Judgment is dragged down by so many ill-conceived ideas and lazy design choices that it hardly even feels like a Gears game anymore. Thankfully, once you get 40 stars in the regular campaign, you unlock Aftermath, which is a brief but extremely overlooked extra campaign. In complete opposition to the main game, this actually feels like what we wanted all along. A nice side story that flushes out the world and characters while also tying itself back to the main story of Gears 3. Aftermath is so divergent from the main game, in fact, that it feels like it should have been a Gears 3 DLC in both content and quality. Maybe that was the original intention, but they decided to toss it in with Judgment as an apology, which is a real shame because I'm sure a lot of people gave up on the game before unlocking Aftermath, especially if they weren't doing the declassified objectives. Aftermath is a great little bonus in what is otherwise a lackluster game, but is it worth slogging through the main campaign in order to unlock it? Unless you're a series completionist, no, probably not. Gears of War Judgment is a high C. Gun is a 6th gen title that was ported onto 360, which is where I played it. It's a GTA style traditional western set in a highly truncated open world that spans from Kansas to Arizona. The gameplay mostly consists of doing chores for various citizens and lawmen while trying to hunt down the man who killed your father. I know, really breaking new ground for the genre here. The small size of the open world helps keep the pace up as you can get from one end of the map to the other in less than two minutes, which is highly appreciated because, as with most GTA style games, the majority of your time is going to be spent on traversal. The missions themselves are fairly standard affairs, usually boiling down to go here and shoot or capture this guy, or go here really fast and then shoot or capture this guy, but there are also hunting and herding tasks to break things up. Granted, the story missions are a lot more varied in design, but if you decide to only complete the main missions, you'll probably be done with the game in only a few hours. The gunplay is also average at best, with overly strong aim assist, brain dead AI, new weapons that are just statistically better replacements for the old ones, and enemies who can't hit the broad side of a saloon, ensuring that you barely have to pay attention during gunfights. That sounds like a lot of negatives, and, well, it is. Gun had the sorry luck of coming out in the mid 2000s when games set in the West were in full swing. In the very same year, you had games like Auto World Stranger's Wrath, Wild Arms 4, Dark Watch, and Samurai Western. And plus, games such as Dead Man's Hand, Red Dead Revolver, Wild Arms 5, God Hand, Desperados 2, and Call of Wada is coming out within a year of Gun's release. Whether they be traditional or non traditional westerns, the market was completely saturated at the time, which meant that an at best decidedly mediocre game such as Gun fails to stand out. This game does, however, have a single saving grace that made it a fun time Unintentional Camp. Gun feels like it's being held together with toothpicks and scotch tape for how often it breaks in deranged ways, to the point where I thought the game was going to crash multiple times, but it just kept on chugging. Seriously, almost once a minute there was an AI script going haywire, or the wrong voice clip would play, characters would bug out and phase through the environment, or the one take they did for a voiceover was so insanely bad that it had me rolling. Shit, Little piece of shit. Truly. Oh! You, you have slain all the mighty beasts. Accept this shirt as a token of our gratitude. Accept this shirt. Of your prowess. Granted, none of these myriad bugs or lack of polish were ever game breaking. Just utterly hilarious. Despite being made by an experienced developer, this game is pure Eurojank, and that aspect added so much more fun to the gritty, straight edge story and banal mission design. Accidental humor can only take the game so far, though. It's not a bad game by any means, it's just very okay. But I think you'd have more fun with the plethora of other better westerns that were releasing at the time. I'll give Gun a C. I was extremely hyped for It Takes Two on PC. Not only because I'm always down for a good co-op game, but I'm also a big fan of A Way Out, having platinumed it twice over the course of six playthroughs. Yosef Fares and Hazelight are one of the few sources of quality co-op experiences left in the non-indie development space. And after hearing people rave about It Takes Two, and it even being awarded Game of the Year among decent competition, helping to re-establish the AA sphere in the process, well, 
it was enough to set my expectations pretty high. I think it's important to know where my head was at going in and that, regardless of what I have to say about it, I'm not trying to disparage the efforts of Yosef and his team. I only want to see them continue to improve and thrive in the future. That said, gameplay-wise, I don't know who It Takes Two is for. Playing through with another veteran gamer left us both feeling bored and disinterested, especially once we hit the second half. While the game throws a vast array of systems at you, it's just as quick to throw them out. Every mechanic that gets introduced is unceremoniously tossed away in favor of something else. This means that there is no progression of the gameplay whatsoever, no evolution in challenge or complexity. The only gameplay element that consistently stays throughout the entire campaign is your basic movement, jumping, dashing, and slamming. This is why the hardest and also the most memorable bosses in the game for most people were the vacuum cleaner, toolbox, and moombaboon, or the giant octopus if your partner couldn't steer, because those are the only bosses that were able to build on what came before and increase in complexity as you went on. The vacuum cleaner gave you very basic patterns to avoid with its smashes, now how do we evolve that? The toolbox gives you more complex patterns and more elements to pay attention to while also slowly decreasing the room you have to maneuver, and then it's made even more complex with Moombaboon. Well, at least for me. Cody gets a fairly simple optical course with the added pressure of being able to look over and see how insane May's side is getting, which forces him to hurry. It pretty much forgets that slamming is a mechanic, but those bosses build upon each other to form what is, by the time you reach its third iteration, a really satisfying fight. And it doesn't feel unfair because you've been honing your jumping and dashing skills since the start, along with your evasion and space management for three bosses now. Problem is, those fights are all in the first quarter of the game. Aside from your basic movement, the other mechanics are thrown away before they can be built on or combined with other gameplay elements. The game throws away every new mechanic after 20 minutes, which combined with the poor pacing led to it being an enormous slog for my best friend and I, who only played the game in 2-3 to three hour sessions before wanting to put it down. Imagine if, instead of only having it for 20 minutes to do some incredibly basic platforming and then fight a boss, you have the hammer and nails for the whole game. You could combine them with more complex platforming so that you have to shoot nails on the fly to make handholds for yourself, or shoot them below you so you have a safe place to land and continue jumping. You could have timing-based hammer parries or bash the ground to give yourself another higher jump, kind of like rocket jumping. Or you could use it to grab a higher ledge and pull yourself up. And I can't even begin to imagine some of the combinations you could pull off if you combine those with other mechanics like the Habshiki or Drill Bazzer, or the Cosmic Inflation and Gravity Boots. No, 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 no! This doesn't even have to make more work for Hazelight, it just requires a rearrangement and structure, and the team wouldn't have to build as many new mechanics if they instead focused on making the mechanics they already have more interesting and fun. Instead, almost every second of this game past the opening hours feels like one tutorial after another. Ironically, just like a child, it seems Yosef gets these toys, plays with them for a little bit, and then immediately gets bored with them and moves on to something else, rather than trying to improve upon them or combine them with other elements. Not only that, but many of these gameplay elements are actually quite similar insofar as the mechanics are concerned. You're being tested on the same skills, just with a slight variation or differing visual flair. You're essentially doing palette swaps of third-person shooting and bashing stuff with a stick for the whole runtime. This in turn means that even if you wanted to invent new mechanics just to throw them out less than half an hour later, there's still no excuse to have zero evolution in challenging complexity, which is why the later portions are such drudgery. But Agrod, I hear you say. This wasn't made for up their own ass elitist pricks that hate every game like you. It Takes Two's mission statement was to create the ultimate co-op game for a duo with any level of experience. To which I'd say that's still no excuse to have zero gameplay progression for 14 hours, but beyond that, It Takes Two's gameplay is certainly not something that you could play with someone who is brand new to video games, as it's far too technical for that. Timing-based platforming with multiple inputs, constantly shifting central mechanics, perspective changes, cooperation, camera control. This simply isn't a game that someone who has to look at their controller to find the A button can play. It has way too much going on and far too quickly for someone who isn't at least a casual gamer to be able to pick up. And yet, it struggles to keep the interest of anyone with even intermediate gaming experience, meaning that this game actually only appeals to a fairly small demographic. My best friend and I played this game across five sessions if I recall, so burning out wasn't the source of the issue, but we were usually ready to be done by the time we stopped playing. And even a casual gamer I talked to about it, who was supposed to be this game's core demographic, described the game as, quote, definitely too long and that it took them over 30 hours despite having actually only played the game for 13, and it also took them six sessions to finish. I had also expected May's gameplay to require a bit less skill than Cody's, since, due to the story and context of the title, a lot of people probably played this with their significant other, maybe even as their first video game. But the difficulty of May and Cody's gameplay is relatively interchangeable, with about half and half sections requiring more skill from either party. You also couldn't play this game with a kid because of the somewhat prevalent cursing, adult themes, and brutal scenes like the vacuum cleaner and Cutie the Elephant. 
So I ask again, who is this game for? The gameplay only appeals to an extremely small subset of players. The optimal way to play this game is of course with your significant other, assuming that they're already a casual gamer, and to get vicarious enjoyment through them, but as we see with Linus Tech Tips, even the most optimized setup isn't foolproof. It was way too easy for pretty much anyone that games. Like, again, I could, I can enjoy it from a my wife is having fun and I'm spending time with her kind of perspective, whereas I walk into a room or a boss battle and I see the glaring weak point and the the obvious sort of you know mechanism for it i'm like oh okay this most of the co-op puzzle sections also leave one player or the other with nothing to do but wait while their partner figures out what they're supposed to do which adds to the tedium i also don't think it's contentious to say that the story is god awful even for people who know nothing about how relationships actually work May and Cody get almost zero development contextualizing who they are as people, what went wrong with their relationship, or why they're even together in the first place. And this in a video game that's nearly as long as The Last of Us. Both are annoying, petty, immature, never shut up even during gameplay, and talk like memeing zoomers despite being in their early 40s, making this game a painfully strong example of Marvel Syndrome. Plus, I don't exactly have a high bar for comedy, but the game only made me laugh once. I plan on doing a full story analysis later on this year, so let's just leave it there for now. By the three-quarter point of It Takes Two, my best buddy and I were both plotting to the unsatisfying end. Almost no interesting mechanics or puzzles, just pure busy work until you finally reach the unsatisfying conclusion. If this game's length was cut in half, fewer of the levels were made in isolation, and the writing was a lot stronger, it could have been something really amazing. The visuals and soundtrack are on point, and the core gameplay controls well but the lack of an overall vision for this game drags it down hard, and I think for his next project, Yosef needs to take a few steps back and reevaluate his process, because he has too many directing credits at this point to be making so many rookie mistakes. It's not a bad game, not at all, and it does improve on some of A Way Out's shortcomings, but it's a game that only appeals to a very small demographic, and I am unfortunately not part of it. That said, I can't wait to see how Hazelight tops themselves in the future, and Yosef, please take my thousand bucks and put it towards your next project. It Takes Two is in the lower B tier. Jack and Daxter the Precursor Legacy on PS3 continues Naughty Dog's never-ending legacy of creative bankruptcy, once again stealing Rare's ideas and creating a subpar simulacrum of a genre-defining game. On the menu this week is Banjo-Kazooie. Unfortunately for Naughty Dog, the 3D collectathon would be killed off by its creators before they could even copy it, meaning that Jack and Daxter was left in the poor position of being a new game in a genre that no one liked anymore. Despite this, Sony was able to pump enough marketing into it that it still managed to sell fairly well. Amazingly though, Jack and Daxter actually turned out to be decent. You trek through an ensemble of varied environments, from sunny beaches, lava flats, and snowy mountains, to underwater cities, putrid swamps, and mysterious islands where you can practically feel the evil bubbling up through the ground, and sometimes see it too. The animation for Jack's movement and combat combined together seamlessly from one to the next, giving him an impressive amount of fluidity for the time, despite his cartoonish embellishments. The same can be said for the cutscenes, as they're far more dynamic in character expression and cinematography than most games could offer at the time, especially for being rendered in-engine. As is typical for Naughty Dog, however, the beauty only runs skin deep. Throughout your 8-11 to 11 hour adventure, you'll find little in the way of gameplay variety. Aside from the minigames, which are few, far between, and last mere moments, the only major shakeup is the zoomer. I would say it's the most annoying, sluggish, imprecise, uncontrollable vehicle I've ever driven in a video game had it not been thoroughly topped in the sequel. It also introduces something that will become far more prevalent in the sequel with its trial and error races. The flying lurkers are also just completely broken. If you try to cut them off, they'll turn on a pixel and start going the other way. So you have to very slowly catch up to them by flying just slightly faster than them, which means, you guessed it, more trial and error until you have their paths memorized. The fact that one of the only things Naughty Dog saw fit to keep from the first game was by far its worst mechanic speaks volumes about their competency. How the zoomer and TPL controls at least makes sense based on the visual design, which can't be said for the second game, but we'll get there. <laughs> oh, we'll get there. I wish this game had a lot more bosses to break up the monotony of the regular enemies. There are three in total, one being optional, and they're some of the most fun parts of the game, but they only leave you wanting more. Monotony in general is one of the game's more glaring issues. Instead of having one-off minigames, it would have made the gameplay something special if there was a unique mechanic for each area, but the majority of playtime consists of collecting orbs the same old way. 
By far the worst issue was the game feel though. Jack constantly drops jump inputs, so much that I just learned to spam the jump button in an effort to get through the game. This isn't a problem with the version I was playing either. The game retains the familiarly floaty and unresponsive physics from the Crash series, making it so that you never feel like you're really in full control, and the ponderous camera that only provides horizontal movement constantly gets stuck on terrain, such that I was forced to use the first person camera whenever I needed to actually see something. The game's difficulty is also a complete mess. You can get hit three times before dying, but to get a hit back you have to collect 50 green orbs. Let me show you how long that takes. All that to get a single hit back. At least the enemy design is generally fair and getting hit is your fault, but it would still be a game-breaking problem if there were any punishment for dying whatsoever. Seriously, outside of the boss fights, dying doesn't matter, so if I wanted to get hits back it was far more efficient to just jump off a cliff than spend three minutes tracking down health orbs. The entire health system doesn't matter, ergo the game has almost zero challenge associated with it, but if death was punishing in any way it would only serve to make the game more annoying. That's about all I have to say. The Precursor Legacy is pretty run-of-the-mill, even for the time. As despite the genre's short stint in the limelight, there are a vast number of better 3D collectathons both preceding and following Jack and Daxter. Another low B tier, but it's at least a decent bedrock for another game, and I can't wait to see how they iterate upon it in the sequel. No! Meanwhile, at Naughty Dog Headquarters! Sir, corporate says we need a new idea for a game. Don't you understand, man? We've never had a new idea. I know, sir. What are we gonna do? Hold on. Let's consult the list. Hmm. Uh, we got Mortal Kombat, Donkey Kong Country, Mario. No, we did that. Um, ah. Wait a second. Grand Theft Auto 3. Hmm. It's just crazy enough to work. And I thought Crash Bandicoot was bad. I'm so tired, man. I'm so tired of people pretending Naughty Dog isn't one of the worst developers in the industry just because they made two good games in 38 years. I'm tired of playing their disgusting excuses for clones of games by real artists, and I'm way past tired of thinking about this piece of shit. This company is a constant reminder that quality means absolutely nothing, that you can sell the biggest pile of garbage as long as you market it properly. You don't even need a PR team because all these brain-dead drones will run interference for you until the ends of the earth, never questioning if one of the eight games they played as a child might have been bad. At some point I think you just have to stop giving people second chances. At some point you just have to accept that this art form and this species are doomed and there's nothing you can do about it. <sighs> so Jack 2 on PS3 is yet another copycat effort from our innovative, groundbreaking friends at Naughty Dog. This shit show follows in Crash Bandicoot's footsteps in that Naughty Dog has no idea what made the original fun and what needed to be improved about it. Jack 2, which I feel I should remind you the cover art looks like this, drops the collectathon roots of the series in favor of a GTA 3 clone, meaning that the worst aspect of the first game not only makes a triumphant return, but feels even worse, and now it makes up most of the gameplay. The vehicles somehow feel worse than riding on the world's slowest rocket through neck-deep tar, with zero ability to steer or slow down without coming to a complete halt. Since Naughty Dog also doesn't grasp the concept of a hover car, you'll be smacking into the ground or sent flying into traffic whenever there's uneven terrain. That wouldn't be such an issue if the streets weren't extremely cramped and packed to the brim with other vehicles and citizens. The cars themselves also make Mercenaries 2's vehicles look durable, with only a few taps of another car or a 10 mile per hour collision resulting in you instantly exploding and losing half of your life. If you want to finish any of the missions in this game, or hell, just drive to your next objective, you're going to be switching vehicles constantly. You also get shoved to the side if you hit any of the people on the ground, which is completely unavoidable since there's a million of the bastards running around in the middle of the street, and none of the hitboxes fit any of the Zoomers models. Since it's impossible to avoid hitting people, you'll be chased by the Crimson Guard throughout 95% of the game, which means that what may as well be the only music track on the OST... ...will be blaring in your ears for the next 20 hours or until you finally go out to the gun store for some extreme close-range target practice. 
You also can't escape the guard at all, since they endlessly spawn inside of you. I was only able to escape them a handful of times through what was either sheer luck or the game glitching out. And of course, the guards always shoot the crap out of you, which knocks your zoomer off course. As if they weren't hard enough to control. This means that the races are some of the most tedious pieces of fluff you've ever played, as you'll have to repeat each one upwards of 5 to 10 times since no matter how well you drive, you'll nearly always get bumped into a wall by one of the pedestrians the game randomly decided was corporeal, or clip the terrible hitboxes on an object and explode. Most of the time, the game just ensures that you'll fail by having incredibly tight timers mixed with gate placement that intentionally misleads you, causing you to lose the race. You could legitimately do worse. What the f did you fucking see that? What the f dude? It's the worst game in the history of human fucking kind, man. <laughs> it's just a side mission. And they can't even put circles on a fucking map. Like, what the fuck, man? Like, you saw the circle pointing me in the complete fucking opposite direction. You saw. That's the third time it's done that. This race! This race! The races are also extremely overlong, once again forcing you to restart and pad the game out as much as possible. You can mercifully skip most of the races in the game, aside from a handful that are required, which is what I should have done, but my dumbass wanted to get the full experience. I just spent as much time talking about the driving in Jack 2 as I've spent talking about entire other games, because not only does it need to be stressed that driving is what you'll be doing throughout the majority of the game, but also just because the driving really is that transcendentally horrid. Driving a zoomer in Jack 2 makes me never want to play a video game again. What's the other 30% of the game like, then? Well, your basic moveset from TPL is still here with all of its faults. The game still drops inputs like it's a thing to do, and the camera still makes most N64 games look like cinematic masterpieces by comparison. Your only new moves are four guns, most of which are useless. The grenade launcher you'll only get in the last couple hours of the game, and it does very little damage for how much of a show it makes of it. The shotgun is situational, but almost never used after you get the assault rifle, which is pretty much the only thing you'll use throughout the entire game, except for occasional bouts with a minigun before you run out of ammo in five seconds. There's also the Dark Jack powers, which take an insane amount of time to build up enough Dark Eco to use, only for what is essentially a debuff. You fly around in an uncontrollable fashion, hitting guys left and right, but if you're not on solid ground, it'll shoot you off a ledge faster than it'll kill any enemies. It also disables your roll for no reason whatsoever, meaning that you no longer have a method of closing the gap. So enemies just have to back up a few steps, which they're programmed to do of course, and all you can accomplish with your spiffy new Dark Jack powers is flailing around like an infant. This mode doesn't make you invincible either until the end of the game, which means that in your flailing you'll take a lot more damage than you would have from just not using your powers. You eventually get some other Dark Jack powers, which are more or less two slightly different styles of bomb, but if you use either of them you immediately go back to normal Jack mode, which means they're completely pointless because you could kill more people without using them, and they don't even affect the larger enemies in the game. This is the most useless power in any video game, and it's not even close. How could anyone Anyone have used this ability a single time and think that it was powerful, fun, or effective? Only the most incompetent, fly-ridden pile of shit for brains could make something that- Ah, sorry, I forgot who made this game for a second. And the plot! I don't even know where to begin. No character development. Entire characters are forgotten about. Character motivations change based on the scene they're in. The villains are complete nothing burgers. Characters forget information they already knew. Plot twists happen out of nowhere and then are subsequently forgotten about. Character drama is invented just so they can have it in a single scene for no reason and forget about it in the next. Seemingly every character in this game has precognition since they know about future events for who knows what the hell reason. A character that was sent backward in time doesn't get sent back forward, wrecking the timeline that's already been obliterated dozens of times over. And of course, the Naughty Dog Special, plenty of ludonarrative dissonance. The, I struggle to call them writers, can't even follow the very basics of their own story. Naughty Dog, I'm gonna level with you here. You people are way too dumb to make a time travel story. You can't even do a half-decent revenge plot. Here's some free advice. K-I-S-S. Keep it simple, stupid. Or, in your case, keep it simple because you're stupid. Every time you've tried to write a story that goes beyond even the most basic plot elements and character motivations, you fall flat on your face. It happened here, it happened with Uncharted 3, and it happened with Last of Us 2. You need to focus on what you're actually capable of. Just write a simple story, three characters tops, then give them a MacGuffin to chase, and have them develop a bit over the course of their journey. That's your peak. Focus on that, because holy shit, dude, the story of this game makes Ahsoka look like coherent writing. 
There's so much more, man. The environments, the mission design, the lack of checkpoints, the padding, the health system, the retreading, the enemies, the broken aim assist, the music, the AI, the quote-unquote difficulty. But I gotta stop. I gotta stop. If I don't, I'm gonna be talking about how bad this game is for another four hours, but it's so goddamn bad that I can't even derive enjoyment from talking about how bad it is. <laughs> All my review needs to be. Jack 2 is the brown note <laughs> of video games. <laughs> you play it and shit yourself. <laughs> Jack 2 is the second worst game I've ever played. And that's only because the first worst game is a hell of a lot longer. It goes above and beyond the call of shit to only retain the worst aspects of the first game while discarding nearly every one of the Precursor Legacy's saving graces. The Jack and Daxter fanbase rejected this game. It sold more than two and a half times worse than the original. That's what happens when you chase trends, Naughty Dog. All I can say is, you got what you deserved. At this point, I struggle to think of a single redeeming feature in this 20 hours of pain and sadness on a disc. Jack 2 reaches an all new low. Sub F tier. I'm done. I'm out. Okay, I think I'm good. Kim Possible Revenge of Monkey Fist on GBA is a pretty standard affair, but does a lot to stand out. While the character sprites need some work, especially Kim herself, who looks like something straight out of a creepypasta, the animation and background visuals are far better than what you'd typically see in a GBA side-scroller, especially one from a relatively unknown developer who specializes in licensed portable titles and ports. There's also a cool detail rarely seen in games with peg-based health where Kim's sprite changes as she takes damage. Although her skin is pink for reasons unknown, they may have run out of colors. Anyway, nearly all of the large cast of enemies are references to goons from episodes in the first season of the show, which is a level of detail that most developers of licensed games fail to capitalize on. The controls are also extremely clean, never leading to any frustration and fully enabling the satisfying precision platforming required in many levels. This game does have some weak points, though. There are only three gadgets in the game that are hardly even worth mentioning. One being a contextual grappling hook, and the other two are just pallet swap explosives capable of the same effects. It also seems a bit out of place to give Kim explosives in the form of lipstick and compacts. Those gadgets belong in the utility belt of someone like Kate Archer rather than Kim Possible, as they're a bit too violent for this series. My biggest issue with the game lies with the combat, which quickly devolves into standing still and punching things until they die. Even in boss fights, this is just about your only real method of defeating foes. Some enemies like Shigo and Draken even preclude blocking or dodging, so it mostly just feels like a race to see who can drain the other's HP first. Speaking of, there are only three unique boss fights in the game, with two of them repeating, which is a huge disappointment compared to the eclectic rogues gallery of bad guys in the rest of the game. There's even an enemy they used as a one-off. <laughs> oh my god! Oh my god! <laughs> this is not cool. It's not cool, bro. Get out of here. It's sad to see that compared to the clear passion and love for the source material put into the rest of the enemies, they either didn't have the time or budget to include a unique boss for every stage. The final fight against Draken is at least a decent mix-up compared to the rest of the combat, as you have to platform in order to get high enough to kick him. But the spinning tops of death that he spawns on both sides of you ensure that you take unavoidable damage once per cycle, which means that, once again, this fight is a race to see who can deplete each other's HP first, which turns into an enormous difficulty spike when playing on the highest setting. Thankfully, even if the mechanics are a bit weak, the combat never becomes tedious, as the game refrains from spamming enemies at you or making them too spongy. That in turn leads to the game being quite short, though. Most playthroughs will probably clock around an hour, and the game offers no replayability, which I'm sure were the primary sticking points for contemporary reviews of the game. Retrospectively, at least, I don't consider this to be much of a negative, and frankly, runtime in and of itself is never something I consider when weighing a game's quality. It's far from the best licensed game out there, even as far as Kim Possible games are concerned, but Revenge of Monkey Fist... Wait, why is it even called that? Monkey Fist isn't even the main bad guy. Eh, whatever. Revenge of Monkey Fist is still a fun size scroller that's worth your time if you're a fan of the show, especially if you can get it on the cheap. It's a B-. LEGO Star Wars 3 The Clone Wars on 360 is a game that I could not have been more excited for. Not only am I an enormous Star Wars fan, but I've seen Clone Wars several times at this point, and while I can recognize its many faults, it did produce some of the best Star Wars that we've ever seen. I also just 100 percent of the complete saga for the first time last year, and I was ready to jump into another LEGO adventure. 
For the time being, I just completed the main story rather than 100%ing it, so I only spent about 10 hours with the game. And that 10 hours was more than enough. The visuals and sound design are absolutely on point, and they nailed the feeling of the series perfectly. The game starts off with a bombastic rendition of the Episode 2 arena that puts the lackluster version in the Skywalker saga to shame. And then the game starts to go downhill. After the prologue, they introduce the RTS missions, if you can even call them that, where you try and use your forces to take over command posts where you can make more forces from, and so on and so forth. This doesn't sound that bad in concept, but then you start to, you know, play it. There's no efficient way of ordering your troops around aside from walking up to them to tell them what to do, and there's no way to delete emplacements without doing the same thing, which means that you'll spend most of the mission driving back and forth if you're lucky enough to have a speeder spawn near you, from command post to command post, issuing orders and praying that the god-awful AI actually decides to listen to you. Or you'll be bashing artillery with a lightsaber for 20 seconds straight. Take your pick. All this while fighting one of the worst cameras I've ever experienced, which makes it nigh impossible to actually issue orders or aim your cannons, especially in multiplayer. These missions just get worse and worse as you go on, to the point where the tedium and frustration really started to wear on me. I dreaded every single time there was a mission like this, which is something I can't say for hardly any of the levels in the original two games. These RTS stages only make up 6 of the 20 levels, but that's at least a third of your playtime that will be spent on what can only be called the antithesis of fun. Once you finish Geonosis, it's off to complete missions from the first two seasons of the show. Though strangely, they are completely out of order. I mean, more than usual, they're neither in release order or chronological order, so clearly someone bungled that pretty hard, but they were too late in production to fix it. The ground levels add very few new elements to the gameplay. Mostly you'll be doing either Simon Says panels with droids, which I shouldn't have to say is some of the laziest design I've ever seen, or you'll be moving around objects manually with the Force, which is often janky to the point of unusability. It was actually so bad that it reminded me of playing Avatar Into the Inferno on PS2, if you guys are familiar with that. Truly some of the most non-functional gameplay I've seen in a AAA 7th gen release. That's not all. When fighting on the ground, the aim assist is completely broken, and you'll just as often do a complete 180 and attack your partner rather than the enemy or object you were facing. I know that LEGO games have never been known for their gameplay, but this game is a huge step backward when compared with its predecessors. I'm really glad I didn't try to complete this game either, because the hub world is so expansive and complicated that it takes forever to navigate. They at least did a fairly good job choosing which episodes to adapt, but there are still plenty of stinkers in there, like Gungan General, which of course they focused on the Jar Jar portion of and not the actually cool prison escape, along with Grievous Intrigue, the Lerman arc, and... Oh god, don't don't make me say it. Uh, duel with the droids. <laughs> all this while ignoring nearly all of Season 2's strongest episodes. I couldn't have expected this going in, but honestly I really didn't like this game. Maybe I've just aged out of LEGO games, but most of the time I spent with LEGO Clone Wars was straddling the line between middling and annoying. For me, the only thing that keeps it from being in the D tier is playable Barris. Barris Offie, at your service. Oh, uh, sorry. I, uh, got kind of... Never mind. Um, where were we? Oh, right. Uh, Lego Star Wars 3 is a uh, low C. I'll give a brief shout to Lingering Shadows on PS3 since I finished it this year. This isn't a game at all. It's an interactive tech demo or art piece, I guess, where you more or less just use the PS3 motion controls to make it continue playing at certain points. I'll grant you that I'm not a visual art connoisseur, but nothing about this 7 minute presentation was interesting or eye catching to me in the slightest, and as far as I'm concerned it wasn't worth the damage it did to my 6 axis. Plus overpriced doesn't even begin to cover it. Linger in Shadows rides the line between being utterly pointless and a flat out scam. Do not under any circumstances purchase this, the entire thing is on YouTube if you're curious. We'll just put this down here with Jack too.